So, um, so we've been talking about some of, uh, well, two of the applications of Faraday's law. And uh, what I want to end with, at least start getting, uh, talking about today, is um, what usually, I, I used to referring it to as in inductance. But um, your textbook will call it self-inductance. And it's actually reference to the whole mutual inductance that I kind of skipped over. I didn't give you any formulas for mutual inductance, but conceptually we didn't cover it. It's a sort of, if you have some amount of current coming in um, on one conducting you know, set of wires, then how much voltage gets generated on another set of conducting wires? Not by direct touch, but by inductance, uh, by, um, well, by inductance, uh, by inducing the uh, voltage here through Faraday's law. So, Self-inductance, which you see a lot more when you're dealing with the circuit, is when this phenomenon where you, know, you treated one as in, one as out, happens on the same device. So the model I want to use for this is a solenoid. So imagine that you have a solenoid. Um, something that looks like this. Ah. So imagine that you have a solenoid. <laughs> Let me try to draw this properly. So you have a solenoid of some number of turns. Um, let's, uh, let me specify more information than, than I usually specify on a solenoid. I'm going to say that this, oops, I forgot to, uh, all right. So I'm going to actually give you the length of a solenoid. I call it a solenoid because we are going to use the formulas that we have derived, but I'll give you the actual length of a solenoid. So I'm not going to be dealing with an infinitely long solenoid. It's on, on, you know, an actual solenoid like this one, a physical solenoid, some length. And you say, all right, it has some, it has some length and some n number of uh, turns. These are the parameters of this solenoid. And, um, oh, I have to give a couple more parameters. I have to tell you how big the solenoid is. I gave you the length. I have to give you the area. So I have to tell you the, the cross-sectional area of the solenoid is some area A. Okay. And, um, and this is the question. If I put in a current, if I put in some amount of current I, um, somehow, by some means. And so this current would be, you know, closing the path here, coming back, and, you know, uh, flowing that way. So if you apply, uh, there, if there's some amount of current I flowing, then the question is, what is the voltage difference across the input and output end of the wire? Okay. Let's uh, go over, uh, step over some pre preliminaries quickly. If this was a constant current, and this is an ideal solenoid, meaning you are, it's made with ideal wires having zero resistance, uh, what would be the voltage difference across the solenoid? Zero, right? Ohm's law says zero voltage develops, and um, if it's a constant current, then Faraday's law never comes into effect. So, so yeah, that's what you get in the case. So we are going to explicitly say this current is a time-dependent current. You, know, you don't know exactly how time-dependent, it's just a function of time. Because that's the only way you are going to get a voltage difference, which may be time-dependent, that's going to be non-zero. Yeah. So you know, I want to come up with an expression for this voltage uh, difference from one end to the other end. So, Voltage difference from point A to B. Good. All right. Um, so I'm going to use Faraday's law. I will say the voltage difference that develops. So I think this is the uh, most intuitive way I can think about it. Imagine that you have a single loop. Um, single loop that you are considering here right now, right? Pedro? Oh, you're drawing on tablet. Okay. Um, so I have this single loop, 
And um, so that area of the single loop is the area that we are given. Mm. What is the, um, let's see. I want to figure out the direction. Um, um, I want to, well, specify the direction so that, um, so I'm not going to be taking absolute values. I'm going to be actually paying attention to the direction this time. And uh, let me say current is a drone um, going in as a drone here. And when I drew this current here, this was the direction that was in my head. Let me make it explicit. Um, on this end, it's going to be coming out of the board. On this end, it's going to be going into the board. Good? And then it keeps looping around the same way. So when the current gets here, the current is still coming out of the board and into the board. Good? So, all right, we did that direction of current in mind. Uh, let's figure out the direction of magnetic field. What direction is magnetic field inside the solenoid? Downward, all right. Um, I didn't quite think it through, but that's fine. We can deal with the downward magnetic field. All right, so I want to have an expression for magnetic flux uh, through this one loop. So when you try to write down for this one loop, what is the magnetic flux? Mm, guess I will try to use the definition, B dot product with the area vector. Here's the question. Um, is this product positive or negative? Negative. Why negative? Because magnetic field is downward? Yeah, so th this is what you have to figure out here. You have to figure out my area vector. Is my area vector pointing up or is my area vector pointing down? Because it depends on that, right? So this is where I'm telling you the right hand rule. So I'm going to pick the direction of my path so that it's the same as the direction of current. So that there's no unnecessary negative sign I have to worry about. So I'm going to always make my path go in the same direction as labeled the direction of current. So, so if the path is going into the board, out of the board, then the area that it's enclosing, you associate a vector with the right hand rule so that the, the normal vector goes in the direction of the thumb. So my area vector, the way it's drawn here, actually points downward. So my B dot A, it's actually positive. So let me write down my flux as, um, I guess, just to, um, that's equal to B A. All right, so that's a flux through, this is through a single loop. So what do you think flux is through the entire solenoid? No, number of turns, right? With each loop, you get additional flux. You pick up additional flux. So, all right. So for the entire solenoid, so the magnetic flux of the entire solenoid is going to be equal to this times n. So n times b a. All right. So this induced voltage here, delta v. Delta V is going to be equal to minus, or let me put it this way. Um, the, the Faraday's law, the original version, E dot DL is going to be minus the rate of change of this uh, solenoid, right? For now, um, what I want to uh, get at is I want to get at the relationship between current and the voltage that is being induced. So let me put in absolute value signs again. So I have, um, so this is what I have. The absolute value of the voltage induced. There's a joke that says a good physicist is a physicist that, that makes only even number of sign errors. And I will tell you that this is one of the areas where it's very common to make sign errors. So voltage induced. Uh, or rather absolute value of it is equal to absolute value of minus rate of change of magnetic flux, right? 
let me plug in uh, what I had before. Oops. Um, so the, this is single loop, which means magnetic flux of a solenoid is equal to the number of loops times uh, BA. So put that in here. So you have absolute value of minus, um, so I'm going to get rid of the minus sign since it's inside absolute value. The rate of change of magnetic flux. So when you look at these three quantities, which ones depend on time? Does N depend on time? Does B depend on time? Yeah, B must depend on time because this B, it's the function of current and current depends on time. So, so okay, it becomes N times A, N times A, time derivative of the magnetic field. Okay? So, so you have some relationship between induced voltage and the rate of change of magnetic field. And what we do when we define inductance is we take the same model that we had when we are dealing with, so I want to say, compared to capacitance. Because inductance will serve a similar role with the magnetic field and current that capacitor did, or capacitance did, with electric charges and electric field. You'll see that later on. So um, what are the, how would you describe the parameters that determine the capacitance of a capacitor? So that's a, like a yeah, surface area, okay. What else could it, uh, determine capacitance? There's no loops in capacitor. Yeah, so, so with the things that determine capacitance, it's the geometry and uh, physical constants. So we want to define inductance in a similar way where inductance only depends on geometry and physical constants. And um, so what we want to say is that you, we have some sort of this relationship that with the capacitor, this is what we had, right? Uh, capacitance is equal to charge per voltage. So you know, charge and voltage is for dynamic quantities. And, um, and but capacitor could be, it's a constant de depending only on geometric quantities and um, geometric quantities. We want to have something similar for inductance. So we want to have some ratio of dynamical quantities that results in um, some kind of, something that depends only on geometry. When you look at this, we are maybe halfway there we have one parameter, one dynamical quantity, induced voltage. But um, on the right hand side, it's not quite complete yet. Um, because the magnetic field is not something that you would find in a circuit. It's kind of hard to get at. So I want to express this magnetic field in terms of the current. Yeah. So I'm going to here, uh, because I'm already out of time, use some of the formulas that we derived earlier. So you guys remember magnetic field of a solenoid, yes? Can someone tell me what the formula for magnetic field of solenoid was from memory? It's not all right that I haven't memorized. It's mu naught times the loop density or number of loops per length times the current. Good. So we are imagining this to be time dependent it's a function of time, of um, for current is the function of time. So when you put this in here, um, constant, constant, only this will get caught by the time derivative. So we say, all right, um, so changing this one more time, this is equal to absolute value n times a times uh, mu naught n over l, mu naught n over l times time derivative of current, di dt. So let me uh, box the dynamical quantities in this expression. So let me rewrite this here. So we are saying this is equal to induce the voltage. And the dynamical quantities are these, di dt and the induce the voltage. So, this is the quantity that we want to define as inductance. This is the quantity 
we want to define as the self or just the inductance. And it's referred to with the letter L. So don't confuse this L with this L. But the common symbol for inductance is L. So um, taking this as a model, then the way inductance L should be defined is the induced voltage divided by this quantity. So inductance L should be equal to the induced voltage divided by um, di dt. Um, and we'll get to this um, on a future lecture. Um, this is a um, relationship that's uh, analogous to Ohm's law. And um, starting next week, actually, we are going to switch back to circuit. We are going to review you know, DC circuit. And we are finally going to do time dependent and AC circuit. And um, we did, this is what we call inductor. This is solenoid is a model of inductor. And the way it behaves in some ways is really similar to register. And this is the, the inductor's version of Ohm's law. And uh, we'll, you'll see all of that later. But for today, um, I just wanted to show this quick derivation of um, inductance. And um, I wanted to do more, but well, I'm out of time. So <laughs> any questions on inductors? You'll see more of that when we deal with the circuits. And I will try to do. Uh, maybe one or two more calculation of inductance. Um, if we don't have time in class, I'll make a video or something.